Good morning, church. Would you stand with us? We're going to sing some praise to our God this morning. Good morning. My name is Leah. And I'm Chris. And we are so glad you are here with this, with us this morning <laughs> worshiping. We just have a few things we want to share with you. Yeah. When you came in this morning, you got a Connect card. We would love for you to fill that out, whether today is your first time. If it is, there's a box you can check. We just want to email you some information. Chris and I are not going to show up at your doorstep or anything. If this is your, I don't know, you figured out how many weeks like you've been. Like 105th time you've we been with us love since the beginning. We would for you to fill that out, 
even still because our team and our staff want to be praying for you. Right. Even if it's just your name, we look at the card, pray for you, for your family. On the back side of that, you can fill out a prayer request because we want to partner with you. We want to celebrate when God is moving and working in your life as well. Yeah. So. We've had two amazing praises this week from those two. We had reports of somebody miraculously recovering from a brain aneurysm. Yeah. And another individual who, ha who went into remission after one treatment of chemotherapy dealing yeah. with leukemia. I was amazing. Chris, I actually had coffee with the lady who wrote that down. It's an incredible story. So God is working That's and right. moving yeah. and we are excited. We have, um, what do we have coming up? Trunk or tree? Trunk or tree? Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. Trunk or tree is on the 28th of October. If you were with us last year, it was so much fun. We figured we had like, I think around like 450 to 500 people come yeah, it was amazing. through. Um, it's here at Owyhee on the 28th. If you would like to partner with us by serving on safety team, donating candy, or you're really wanting a lot of fun and you want to bring your vehicle and decorate, we would love to have you do that with us. Um, you can head online to register for um, any of that. That's right. Hey, and if you're planning on decorating a trunk, I got to tell you, you got to bring your A-game. We had some amazing trunks last year. Yeah. It was incredible. Also, on your way in, you may have noticed some Christmas trees. I walked in, I was like, those are some very Christmassy balloons. <laughs> <laughs> we are not following Walmart by putting up Christmas decorations around Halloween, okay? There's a purpose. We're partnering with Operation Christmas Child again this year. That's right. It's an amazing organization where you get to take home a box, you get to fill it with appropriate toys and items for boys or girls, and it goes out to families in need, helps these children in need. And honestly, each box in and of itself is a way that the gospel is spread because these kids, they get these gifts and they go tell all their friends about it. And it's just so amazing. Last year, we filled 133 boxes. This year, we have 200. Do you think yeah. we can fill that? Yeah. yeah. I know, it's a great way, especially if you have some youngers, a tangible way for them to participate in giving at this time of year. So yeah. I know I did it last year. It was, my big girls get it, but for my little two, it was really cool to pick out things and pray over the box before it's sent out. So it's an incredible opportunity for Absolutely. us. Absolutely. Hey, so we wanna kinda of transition back into worship, but I wanted to share something with you that I came across and experienced this week. I've had a couple conversations with some people this week about this idea that we as Christians have to be perfect. Does anybody else hear that, feel that tension sometimes? Because I know that I do. It's like if we're not perfect, then how could God accept us as we are? But the funny thing is that when we look at perfection, we're like, we're aiming for the wrong target. Yeah. Because God doesn't love us for our perfection. It's not our perfection that brings him joy, because if that's the case, he would be like joyless all the time, yeah. right? Rather, it's our obedience. And you might say, well, aren't those one and the same? But they're not. Perfection's like the end goal. Obedience is the process. Yeah. God knows that we're not perfect. He made us that way so that we can rely on him. But the amazing thing is that our God from the very beginning, before he even made us, before he made the earth, he had a plan to reconcile us back to him. His son, before the beginning of time, knew what he was going to do, and he was willing to do it even then. And it's God's grace, by God's grace, that perfection is not the thing that we should be seeking. It's obedience. It's submitting ourselves every single day, dying to ourselves, and going towards Christ, chasing after him. So would you pray with me for that this morning, in that? And as we do, I really want to encourage you, as we go into worship, lean into it. It doesn't matter who's around you. Be as crazy as you want. David was undignified dancing in the streets. Follow David's example. All right. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. I just thank you for this day, and I thank you for all the people here, Father. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would move in a mighty way so that there would be no guilt or shame around this idea of perfection, Father, because you don't call us to perfection. You call us to obedience. Nehemiah 8.10 says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And when yes. we are obedient, God, you are joyful. I pray that you would instill a desire on each and every single person's heart today towards obedience, the process of trying. It doesn't matter how many times we fail, Father, but as long as we keep 
walking towards you, you are joyful. And I pray that that joy would just fill everybody's heart this morning, overwhelming, so that as we praise you, God, that they would hear us in heaven, that we would join the choirs of heaven praising you this morning. And I pray all these things in your mighty name. Amen.
I love the words of this song, you were faithful then and you'll be faithful now. The Bible tells us that the same power that raised Christ from the dead dwells in me, and dwells in you. And the way that they worshiped thousands of years ago is the same God we're worshiping today. It is the same power that, that, that brought Christ from the dead. It's the same power that did the miracles through the New Testament. It's the same power that brought you to salvation, you to a right relationship with God here and now. And that's something to worship about, isn't it? That's something to praise him over and to, and to just say, thank you, Lord, for the goodness of who you are and what you've done and what you will continue to do. It's, it's something that we can worship over. It's something we can praise him over, can't we? Can't we? So here's what I like to do. Can we just take a moment and maybe raise a hand and say, Lord, I'm worshiping you today. Just, just a prayer of worship right now. Let's pray that together. Father, we worship you now. We surrender our hands raised as an act of surrender, our, our heart full of your presence and who you are. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that as we surrender in this place, that we would be under your authority and we would see you move and we would see your work happen because you, Lord, are the one who moves mountains. You're the one who worked and made a way when there seemed to be no way. And today you're the same God doing the same things in the same way. And so I pray, Lord, that this morning, there would be continued motion and movement as we, your people, surrender again, just like we've done for thousands of years. And may we continue to do until you return. I pray that today, as we worship and sing your praises, we would experience your presence in such a real, precious, and tangible way. Thank you, Jesus. And together we say, amen. Amen. Go ahead, have a seat. But before you do, give someone a high five and say, good morning, church. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, if we've never met before, my name is TJ, and uh, I, I'm the pastor here at Refresh. And this week, I was out of the country doing some mission stuff in Belize, kind of a scouting trip for all of you guys to go with me back to Belize and do some awesome work. And so today, what I want to do, oh, you guys can, if you, you, you want to clap, let's clap. Let's do this thing. All right. And I'll give you a little bit of update on that. Uh, before I do that, I want to remind you that our, uh, our end of year giving is coming up. I talked about it two weeks ago. And can you guys pull up that slide for me real quick? Um, our end of year giving slide. We'll get there. Yeah, we'll get there. Um, and so, but what we're doing is we're, we're giving in tiers again, like we did last year. We have a goal of $30,000. And the, the first $5,000 we want to put into local partnerships. And we have some really, really great ministries here in the Treasure Valley, don't we? Really, really great things. One of them is the Refresh Network that we started to help send out and do more of these types of ministries. We partner with uh, organizations like Launchpad, Lifeline Pregnancy Center, Child Evangelism Fellowship, uh, Youth for Christ. We've got a bunch of different ones going on in this area that we want to support. And this, uh, this first tier, we want to pour it right back into the Treasure Valley. Somebody say amen. The next layer is the sort of a national layer. So we got the local layer, then the national layer is church planting. I believe in church planting with all my heart, obviously, because I've, I'm a church planter myself. I believe, and I believe in it so much so that I want us to invest. When we talk about national change in our nation, I believe that church planting is the best way to do that. More people meet Jesus through church plants than any other method in the United States. More people come to Christ from church plants than any other way. Not rallies, not radio stations, not any parachurch, anything. It is churches that are doing that work. And so we want to invest there. It's the most return on our investments. We're planting more churches in this coming year. Um, we continually are giving to church planting. Last year, we did the same thing. That money went to Houston, Texas, and they're launching in January. And I'm super pumped to give you guys a report on that as they get closer. Um, and so it's going to be really great there. And then this, this next tier is Children's Cup. And that's who I traveled with this week, Children's Cup. It's an organization um, they've got, it's been around for over 30 years and they've got, uh, different, what they call care points all over the world. Sometimes 
They're in Eswatini, South Africa. They're also in Honduras, Mexico, Dominican Republic. Um, there are a couple different other places and where I went, Belize. And Belize is one of their newer countries that they're partnering with. And so there's new things happening there, new groundwork kind of happening. They don't have an established footprint yet, but they have an established ministry. They don't have necessarily all the things that they want, but they're moving forward in that direction. And we can partner with them to bring more hope and more healing to those people there in Belize. And so here's how it works. They show up and they start what they call a care point. And a care point is a place where they're able to connect with kids. Their, their primary place of connection is always through kids. There's kids that are in need, kids that are hungry. And in that, that place where we were, were going, it's a village named San Jose. It's in Belize. It's sort of in that northwest corner of the country. Uh, it's 20, about 2,500 people. They have a school and the kids go to school. And when they release them from school to go to lunch, some of the kids go home and there's no food. And so they start a, a care point where these kids can come in about 60 kids every day, show up to that care point. They're getting fed. They have special uh, mana packs is what they call them. You guys may have heard of mana packs. It's, it's nutrient enhanced foods. It's really nutrient dense so that one meal a day can make a big impact in their life. Um, and then they also do a, a Bible lesson and songs and games with them as well at that time. So it's, they're feeding their body, but they're also feeding their soul. And then there's also other programs that develop around that, like their sports outreach. How many, how many know football, not the American football, is pretty big everywhere else? It's huge. I was like, I was sitting at a table with these kids and I'm like, what do you like to play? And they're like, football. And I'm like, what about you? Football, football, football. I was like, is there another sport? No. Like, okay. All right. Um, and so one of the cool things about the, uh, the Belizean culture in the school system is they teach these kids English in school on the regular. And so a lot of these kids had the ability to, I could just talk straight to them, no interpreter or anything like that, because my Spanish is bad. <laughs> Un poquito, you know what I'm saying? It's just not very good. Okay. So I uh, got to do that. And the cool thing about the partnership that we get to start there is that right next door to it is church. And that pastor has been there for four years. He's from El Salvador. He's a missionary to that community absolutely loves that community, wants to stay in that community. Um, and they're letting us use their old building for free. And so they're bought into this idea that these kids need Jesus and they're supporting us as we do that. That I say us as in children's cup. And I want us as a church to dive in that as well. So that's kind of where we are. And over the course of time, they actually own property next to the church children's cup does. And I'd like to build a playground, a soccer field, and a feeding place there with like up the facilities. Cause how many know, like an old church building in Belize isn't exactly perfect for feeding 60 kids a day. <laughs> we need to get in there and up that and help them do that. And so they already own the property. So our goal over the next couple of years is to just keep investing in that and see that life change happen and take you guys to go minister to these kids as well. And uh, it, was a, it was a really incredible opportunity. And I'm telling you, you can't go down to a place like this and not see the world differently. That's why I took my daughter with me. It's because I want her to see the world differently. I want you guys to see the world differently. I want your kids to see the world differently. And so um, once the dates are out for those, that trip that we're going to take, I'll let you guys know as soon as possible. And if you want to get on the short list, just write it on your connect card. I want to know about Belize. I want to be on the list. That when the dates come out, email me right away and just write it on there and then we'll we'll make that happen, all right? So the next tier on here is Key of Hope, which is in Durban, South Africa. Longtime friends of mine that I've seen their work multiply and grow into the thousands of kids in Durban, uh, making the impact on them. And so I highly encourage you when they come here in January to spend a weekend with us, don't miss that Sunday. I believe it's January the 7th that they're gonna be here. Uh, Dan and his wife, Rachel, are incredible people. We're gonna support that. And then the final $10,000 is gonna to go to our Kingdom Builders Opportunity Fund. And so that's all gonna happen on November the 12th. That's kind of our big give day. So it, I'm telling you well in advance so that you have an opportunity to ask God and do what he says. Can y'all do that for me? Ask God and do what he says. That's my goal for every person in this room. Ask God, listen for his voice, and then just do whatever he tells you to do. And then we're gonna end up changing the world 
through our lives, through our church. And, and what we're going to do is, is do it this way this year. This is how we're going to break it down. So can you guys do me a favor? I would like to pray, but not just pray just to transition a segment or pray to just have like a, some way that we get to the preaching or things like that. I want to actually pray and ask God, what would you have me do? What would you have me do in this for Belize, for local missions, for planting churches, for whatever it is? What would you have me do, Lord? And then I want you just to listen for his voice. Can we do that now? Let's close our eyes, bow our heads, and just take a moment to listen for the Holy Spirit. Father, we are people here now. We know, understand, believe that you're calling us not just to live our life, but to make a difference. You're calling us to change the world around us. And so today we ask you the question, what would you have us do? How would you have us change the world? How would you have us give? How would you have us live? Do you want us to go on these trips? So Father, we listen for that voice and understand that you, Lord, above and beyond everything else, are the guide and the light of our life. And to you, Lord, we say yes. Thank you, Father. In your name we pray. Everybody says amen. Amen. Hey, you all know today is Pastor's Appreciation Day. So can we give it up for Pastor TJ? If you see him in the lobby, give him a big hug, a high five. Um, One of the things, let me brag on my pastor really quick. One of the things I love about Pastor TJ is he is so open-handed and humble when it comes to this platform. Uh, I've worked with a lot of pastors that have a lot of really talented gifts, and they hold tight to them and guard it, rightly so. But I just appreciate him opening up the opportunity for me to speak to you guys this morning, other people to speak, and even across our whole church, all of our ministries. He just loves to empower people. So I love our pastor. Thank you, Pastor TJ. Let's give it up for him again. So I was talking to Pastor TJ a couple weeks ago, um, just trying to figure out, like, what do we talk about today uh, for the sermon? And we're in the middle of this nine to five series that we started last week. So do we stick with that? Do we do a one-off kind of thing? And one of, the, one of the words that's been on my heart lately is the word maturity. And I know that pretty much anyone from any age, when they hear that word maturity, they're like, I don't need to mature. Whether you're, you know, 20, I remember being 20 and being like, I don't want to mature at all. I like, I like being young and kind of dumb, right? And maybe you're older and you've been in church a little bit, a little while, and you're like, I don't need to mature. I've been doing this for years, right? But there's something about, one of the things I've learned about being a dad is that when you have a year and a half old, my son Denver, he's the best thing in the world, but he's got a lot of growing and he's got a lot of learning to do, amen? Anyone with young kids in the house? Yes, they got a lot of maturing to do. And the reality is, our church is very young. We just celebrated our two-year a couple of weeks ago, which was a lot of fun on Sock Sunday. But the reality is, is, when you bring a bunch of different people together with different backgrounds and different experiences, different preferences, it takes a while to grow your church's culture. And so that's what I'm talking about with maturity. And so I asked Pastor TJ, hey, can we, can we dive into our worship culture this morning? And just, and I'd love for us to take a step in developing and maturing our worship culture together. You guys with me? So, so here's the thing about worship culture. I think a lot of us think worship culture is like dictated by your worship leader. Like, oh, whatever the worship leader does, he, he's determining what our church's worship culture is. Or maybe the worship team, maybe the lead pastor. But in reality, you guys play the biggest role in developing our church's worship culture right? Um, Before I get too far into this, does anybody love Costco? Any Costco holics out there? Um, So I don't love Costco. It's not my favorite place to go, but I am developing an appreciation for what Costco has to offer. All right, I'm at that age. I'm 30. I'm not quite rocking the New Balance dad shoes just (laughs) quite yet. Um, But my dad, my dad loves Costco. He's loved Costco since I was like, yay high. Uh, as far back as I can remember. And one of the things that my dad used to do, he would always buy those big old jars of cashews. You know, y'all know what I'm talking about? Those Kirkland salted cashews. 
And so when I was little, I remember him coming home and, and that was one of his favorite snacks. And so I, there was at one point in time, he came home and he unscrews the lid, sits down on his recliner, pops some in his mouth, and he realizes very quickly that these salted cashews are unsalted. Like Costco messed up here. And my dad, he, you don't mess with my dad's Costco purchases, all right? So he's looking at the label, he checks the receipts, checks the ingredients, he's like, no, these are supposed to be salted. And I don't know how many times my dad did that until he came home early from work one day and found nine-year-old Andrew on the couch with his cashews just sucking all the salt <laughs> right off of him and putting them right back into the jar. My dad's a pretty chill guy, but that was a scary moment for a nine-year-old. All right. And so I tell you that story because when it comes to worship, we all have different preferences, right? Maybe some of us are like nine-year-old Andrew, where we like our worship to be super salty and flavorful, right? Maybe you want to call that charismatic. Maybe that, that means lifting your hands or dancing around, whatever that looks like. Some of us like it super salty. And others, we like it unsalted. We, we like just the basics. We're like, God knows I love him. He doesn't need me to sing this chorus 18 times for him to know that. Just once right? Less is more. And then some of us might be like my dad, where we are expecting salty and we get unsalted, or, or we're expecting or hoping for unsalted and we get salty, right? You guys with me? And, and the truth is, is that we all have preferences or ways that we worship that we're comfortable with. And there's a story in the Bible where, where Jesus combats the idea of preference or comfort and it comes in John chapter 9, verses 49 through 50. And what's happening here is the disciples are witnessing something that they're not okay with, they're not comfortable with, and so they go to Jesus with it. And John says to Jesus, Master, we saw someone using your name to cast out demons, but we told him to stop because he isn't in our group. But Jesus said, don't stop him. Anyone who is not against you is for you. All right, so, so what does that tell us? I think so often we get in this headspace of like the way I do things, the way I'm comfortable with, if I see somebody doing something different, it's like, Jesus, what's going on here? This isn't, this isn't what we, this isn't what I like. This isn't my preference. He's not in my group. And Jesus says, if they're not against you, they're for you. And so here's the truth about styles of worship. Refresh doesn't need a refresh style of worship. We don't need an Andrew style of worship. We don't need a Pastor TJ style of worship. We don't need anybody's style of worship. We need a biblical style of worship. And, and what's funny to me is I think we have a pretty good gauge on our default in our lives is pretty much unbiblical in every way, shape, and form. Like we're sinners. We're, we're not good by nature. And it's funny to me that in this specific, like when it comes to church things, we're like, no, my default's right. My default's biblical. And we just have this, this mindset that, that our default, when it comes to ministries or the way a pastor preaches or the way we worship, that, that what I'm comfortable with, my preference, my default is the right way of doing things. And we need a biblical style of worship here as we develop our worship culture at Refresh. And so, you know, I, I just said you guys play a vital role in that culture. But the question is why? Why do you guys play a vital role why do we need a biblical style of worship? Why can't we just stick with what we're comfortable with and what we know? And so we're going we're gonna to talk about that this morning. First, I just love to pray over this because uh, I know this is, can be a touchy for some of us and uh, we're challenging ourselves. So I'd love to just pray uh, for God to work this morning in all of us. God, thank you for this chance to speak. Thank you for this chance just to dive into your word and what you're asking of us, God, what we can offer you, uh, which may seem little at times, God, but we know uh, that you can do so much with so little. So we love you. We're thankful. In your name we pray. Uh, God's people said. Amen. Amen. All right, if you're taking notes, this is point number one. We got five points this morning. Uh, point number one, worship is internal, external, and eternal. Lots of urnals. <laughs> internal, external, eternal. We're going to start off with internal. John chapter four, verses 23 through 24 says, but the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit 
and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way, for God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And so what does this tell us? Uh, Our spirit is internal, right? And some of us might say our spirit, some of us might say our heart, but our worship derives from the inside, right? Our worship starts from our love for God. And so the, the, the scary and kind of interesting part about this verse is it says that this kind of worship is what the Father is looking for, right? So for some of us, maybe external worship is fine, but internally, we got some things to work out. And, and, and this is what the Father is actively seeking when it comes to how people are worshiping him. He wants to know what's happening on the inside. And the next part of this, external. This is going to make some, some of us a little squirmy. External. One of my favorite scriptures is Romans 12, verse 1. It says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. You know, this says giving your bodies. Other translations say, you know, offer your bodies. But what does that look like? And so I got a little curious this week and um, talked to some people way smarter than me uh, in scriptures. And they showed me that I could do a word search. And so I did a word search on on some different forms that we commonly see when it comes to worship in Scripture to see how many times they actually show up in the context of worship. And so the word clap, you know, we encourage everybody to clap, right? The word clap comes up six times. The word dance comes up eight times. Here's a fun one. Lifting your hands comes up six times. And the big one, sing to the Lord 269 times. Some of y'all are like, I don't sing. I'm like, well, the Bible says we do. So make a <laughs> joyful noise, right? When I, I, I've been leading worship since I was 14 years old, so over 15 years now. And, and I remember there's a lot of times where I was leading that I would leave, you know, the church or the venue or wherever we were leading worship just feeling so defeated because as much as we maybe felt the Holy Spirit moving in that place, what we were seeing from people's engagement level didn't reflect what we thought it should be. And I remember, you know, people would come to me from time to time and, and try and encourage me and say, well, well, Andrew, they're just worshiping on the inside. And, and so for a long time, I just rolled with that. I was like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm not going to challenge people to step out of their comfort zones. I'm not going to teach people what, what this part of biblical worship looks like. And, and the reality is, is that sometimes we see that in, in Romans 12, 1, that worship is external. And in John 4, 23, worship is internal. And sometimes we like to just pick which one works best for us. Sometimes we're like, no, I don't want to mess with the internal stuff right now. I don't want to deal with that, but I can lift my hands and make, make everyone think everything's all good. And maybe it's the other way. Maybe, maybe we're like, I like worshiping on the inside, but that makes me uncomfortable over there. What, what am I going to look like to everybody else? And, and the reality is with these two scriptures is they go hand in hand. It's not either or. If you pull up that next slide for me, It says, true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit. So we know that's true. That's a truth in scripture. And give your bodies to God. This is truly the way to worship him. These are are both, not both or or one or, right? And so I believe that when we are fully internally worshiping God in spirit, we have no choice but to watch it overflow into the external. And lastly, we have eternal I follow this Instagram account called uh, 90s Kids for Life. <laughs> Born in 1993. And, and I love this account. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Just turned 30, still young. Um, I love this account because of all the nostalgia. That's like a thing nowadays, nostalgia. Um, I don't know if it's just because my age, my generation is coming into this age or not, but this account has all sorts of posts every single day from like all the toys we used to play with as kids and what Target used to look like way back in the day. Walmart used to have fish. Like I learned that, I remembered that. 
Um, But one of the things I realized watching this account for six hours a day for two weeks um, (laughs) was that everything in this world has an expiration date. Every single thing in this world has an expiration date. Every, uh, there, are, there are things in this world that have value one minute and they lose their value the next, right? One minute they're telling worship leaders to wear skinny jeans. The next they're telling them to wear baggy and then back to skinny. It's just everything changes value all the time. Styles and, and what we buy. Your family, your family always changes, right? Sometimes it grows. Sometimes it, it decreases. Your job changes. You might have one job one day, one job the next the world around us is changing. Chat GPT is going to take over the world here soon. <laughs> My point being is that everything loses its value at some point, but God is the only constant thing who is worthy of our admiration and worship. He's the only thing. From Genesis to Revelation, which talks about the future, we know that God is worthy of our praise. So our worship is eternal. Internal, external, eternal. Point number two this morning, we're talking value. Worship places value. So many times we, I think the modern church has, has linked music and worship together, right? But the truth is, is worship is not a genre. My wife and I used to work out a lot. I know it doesn't look like that right now for me, but we used to, we used to work out a lot and we'd be like, hey, what playlist do you want today? You want a hip hop playlist, pop playlist, country playlist, or worship playlists, right? Even I'm guilty of that. And there's a story in the Bible in Matthew 26 that shows that worship is far beyond just a song. So we're gonna start in verse six, if you're following along. It says, meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who had previously had leprosy. While he was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume and poured it over his head. That's Jesus' head. Worship means that we are placing worth or value onto someone or something. This woman took something that was potentially the most expensive thing she owned, potentially all she owned, and anointed Jesus in worship with it. And in our lives, we can see the things that we worship and value pretty easily based off of the things that we're putting worth to, right? My wife and I, we we have a budget every month. We we do our best to stick to it. And we have what we call spending money, right? I'm not allowed to judge her on the Amazon boxes that show up as long as they're in this budget, right? And she's not allowed to judge me on my purchases. Um, But if you get the receipts for those purchases, you can very easily see what we put value to in our lives, right? Every week on Sundays, I get a a notification on my phone for screen time. Thank you, iPhone. (laughs) And it tells me how much I've spent on Netflix, time I've spent on Netflix or Amazon or Instagram. And if you get the timestamps of those, you can see very easily what we value in your life. And so the question that might sound harsh, but I'm, I, I promise you I'm preaching this to myself as well, is you have to ask yourself when it comes to worship, how much do you value Jesus? Like I've had screen time reports on my phone where I have 15 hours on the fantasy football app and two in the Bible, right? So it, it begs the question, how much do I really value Jesus in my life? And that's something that I think if we get those receipts and we take some notes, we can start to make adjustments and we'll see difference in our worship, both in song and in our lives. And and verse number eight tells us how the disciples value Jesus in this moment. So, So this woman anoints Jesus and verse eight says, the disciples were indignant when they saw this. What a waste. They said, what a waste. Like, what an insult to Jesus in that moment. Like, yeah, he teaches good, but really the whole bottle? The disciples looked at this woman and and their first thought was, it's too much. It's too much. And how often in church do we come in 
and we look at someone who's raising their hands and we go, it's too much. It's too much. And the truth is, you don't know what they're surrendering over to God in that moment. How often do we look at someone who's singing a little loudly and we're like, oh, that's too much. It's a distraction for me. We like to use the word distraction in place of too much a lot. And in reality, we don't know what they're declaring victory over in that moment. How often do we look at someone who's dancing in worship and we think too much, but the reality is we don't know what they're celebrating. How much do we look at someone, how often do we look at someone who's on their knees and think it's too much, but you don't know how big the thing is they're asking Jesus for in that moment. And the truth in this story, and a little bit to the defense of the disciples here, maybe this woman is responding in a way and because of something that she had experienced that they hadn't experienced yet. You see, Matthew in this, in this, in this book tells us a story that, of his perception of this woman, like this woman comes and does this. But if you go to John, John tells us his perspective and he answers the question of who this woman is. And so in John 12, we find out that this, this woman is Mary, the sister of Lazarus. And so without any context, right, we, we need some context to this story to understand why she's acting the way she is, why she's worshiping the way she is. And so if you go to John 11 and get your context, we find out that, that Jesus had ra raised Lazarus from the dead, her brother. And so when Mary encounters Jesus for the first time, since she's seen this miracle happen in her life, the guy who, who changed her entire world, brought dead things to life in her life, literally. She didn't look around the room and say, what is everybody else doing? She didn't look and say, what, what are the people that maybe are getting comfortable with Jesus doing in this moment? She looked at him and said, you have changed my life and you deserve my very best worship. Some of y'all are wondering what this thing is up here. <laughs> See, sometimes we, we have circumstances in our life where we feel bound and imprisoned. Yes, I'm going to preach in there in a minute. And see, Mary was in a season in John chapter 11 where she was bound by the loss of her brother. She was probably feeling all sorts of ways about it and was feeling imprisoned. And in John chapter 12, She's in a different circumstance. Her season, her life looks different. And so because of that, she's willing to give Jesus her worship. But here's the thing that, that might be different from Mary's perspective and how she worshiped. Point number three, worship requires confidence in God, not our circumstances. Worship requires confidence in God, not our circumstances. See, and in, in this moment for Mary, she, her circumstance, she's free from a lot of the pain and the suffering and, and the, the hard moments of her life. But there's another story in Acts chapter 16. It's one of my favorite stories in the whole Bible about Paul and Silas. And their circumstance looks very different than that of Mary's. Starting in verse 22, they're ministering in the city and, and evangelizing and Verse 22 says, a mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. They were severely beaten, and then they were thrown into prison. The jailer ordered, was ordered to make sure they didn't escape, so the jailer put them into the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in the stocks. Circumstances were different, right? My son, Denver, even a couple weeks ago, he's out in the lobby running around having a grand old time, just being a, a, a PK, pastor's kid. And uh, Pastor uh, TJ's lovely wife, Leah, comes up and says, man, he is such a different kid now that he can walk around and run. See, when he was little, he was such a little free spirit and wanted to just go be a boy that he couldn't crawl or walk. He would get so frustrated. He gets so mad. His little fist would clench up and his face would turn all red. And, 
you know, he'd have to be picked up by mom or dad to go where he wants to go. And it just drove him nuts. And how often are we the same way in our circumstances, right? When things are good, like Mary, we're all good. But then when we're, when we're imprisoned by whatever it is in our life, our attitude changes. And Paul and Silas's attitude remained the same. And we see that in verse 25. It says, around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. They're sitting in prison. They're over here in this prison, in this dirty, gross dungeon, probably bleeding, probably hurting. And the reaction is not to say, God, you'll get my praise and admiration when you fix this. Their reaction is to say, God, you're, you're, you're worthy, right? And so that brings up point number four, is that worship doesn't wait on miracles. Yeah. Write that down. That, that's a big one this morning. Worship doesn't wait on miracles. See, oftentimes we like to say, God, you are worthy if. You are worthy if you fix this problem in my life. You're worthy if you show up and do the things that I know you can do that the Bible says you can do, then I'll give you my worship because I have something to worship for. But when it comes to worship, worship actually requires us to say, God, you are worthy of my worship even though I lost my job and still haven't gotten a new one yet. Worship requires us to say, God, you are worthy of my worship even though my family member is dying of cancer. Worship requires us to say, God, you are worthy of my worship even though we still can't get pregnant. Worship doesn't wait on miracles. And so I want to actually amend this statement and say, God, you are worthy still. That's what Paul and Silas were declaring in that prison. God, you are worthy still. And then what happens? We get our suddenly in verse 26. We need to worship before our suddenlies. It says, suddenly there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open, and the chains of every prisoner fell off. Right? They got their miracle, but they worshiped through the hard part to get there. And, and here's the craziest part of the whole story. This is why I love this story. We see lots of times where people are worshiping God in hard situations, right? In the Bible. But verse 27 paints a different picture, a different perspective that I think is vital when it comes to worshiping and understanding what biblical worship is. Verse 27 says, the jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. He assumed the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself. But Paul shouted to him, stop, don't kill yourself. We are all here. What? What? Like, the doors are open. They got what they were praying for. They got what they were worshiping for. And, and the reality of this situation is that Paul and Silas weren't worshiping for that. They weren't praying for that. See, they're sitting in this cell, broken, beaten, hurting, and they're worshiping. What a beautiful name it is when no one else would worship in this moment. And then the earthquake happens. They get there suddenly and, and their shackles break and the walls come crashing down. <laughs> Startled some of you. And they don't take their miracle and run. They stay. They stay right here. See, Paul and Silas understood a really important thing when it comes to worship. And that means that, that that's worship means getting comfortable with the uncomfortable. Paul and Silas, it wasn't about getting out of prison for them, right? They were, they were comfortable enough with the uncomfortable in their lives that they knew that God was probably up to something bigger than just their own comfort. See, sometimes I think we think worship is transactional. Even if we're worshiping before the miracle, we get the miracle and we're like, sweet, I, I got what I needed. And Paul and Silas were waiting on God to do something bigger. And so verse 29, 
Acts 16, verse 29 says, the jailer called for the lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. I imagine this jailer wasn't too kind to them six hours before. Then he brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. Because Paul and Silas were willing to be comfortable in the uncomfortable, generations and generations of a family were saved for all eternity. And so I told you in the beginning of this sermon that, you know, there's a, there's a I'm going to answer the question of why you're vital to this worship culture. And it's because worship starts with you, but it doesn't end with you. Worship starts with you, but it doesn't end with you. Worship is not about what we get. Worship is not about, hey, God, I'm worshiping you and, and I'm expecting something to change in my life. Like, yes, there are going to be times where, where our worship breaks down the walls and the prison walls in our life and breaks the shackles that we're experiencing. But we have to understand and own that worship goes beyond just our person. It goes beyond our own comfort. Right, because Paul and Silas understood that a family's lives were changed. And it's so important for us as we build our worship culture here, for us to be able to say that this, ain't, this isn't about me. I'm gonna give worship to God regardless of whether what my circumstances look like. I'm gonna give worship to God whether or not it makes me comfortable or not. I'm gonna give worship to God regardless of what happens in my life because he is constantly and eternally worthy of our worship. And you watch when we have that kind of mindset. Our, if our church has that kind of embrace of worship, you watch the things God's going to do, not just in your life, but in those around you. And I'll wrap with this. Mary's circumstance was different than Paul and Silas's. They looked very different in, their, in the moments they were worshiping. But all three of them had experienced firsthand the grace of God. And maybe some of us here are sitting here and, and maybe we're like the disciples where we maybe have experienced firsthand the grace of God, but we've been hanging out with Jesus a long time. We've been doing life with him a long time and, and maybe the edges are a little dull in our relationship with him. And we need this reminder by, by Mary and her willingness to remember the things that God has done for her in her life and say, you deserve every bit, every single thing I can give value with. I'm gonna give it to you, God. Maybe some of us have yet to experience firsthand the grace of God in our lives. And maybe that's, that's you this morning and, and you want to. You're like, man, this kind of worship sounds great. Having some, this kind of purpose in, in my life sounds amazing. I'd love to just pray a prayer with you this morning. Whether, you, whether this is brand new for you or whether this is a reminder for you. I want to empower our church, our church family to own worship beyond just me, beyond just our team, beyond just Pastor TJ. And let's be a church that worships biblically. Let's be a church that worships because we understand the worth of our Lord and Savior. Amen? Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for this just time together to dive in, God. And I just pray that we would be open-handed. God, we all have preferences. We all have comfort zones. We all have things that, that work for us. God, I, but I just pray that you would, you would remind each of us and just touch each of our hearts in a manner that, that opens up our eyes to the things that you're asking us to do, God. The ways that you're asking us to live, the ways you're asking us to worship you. God, and this is new for us. If this is, this is something that maybe this is the first time we're hearing something like this, firsthand the grace that you give. God, I just pray that, that we would open up our arms to that free gift of salvation through Jesus this morning. That we would say yes to the relationship that you so desperately want with us. 
and that we would start giving you the worth and value you deserve. We love you, Father, in your name we pray. All God's people said, amen. Would you guys stand and worship with us this morning?
God, we just thank you for this moment. God, that you are here and you are moving and you are working in ways we can't even see, God. For the people here, Lord, who are standing with unanswered questions and, and confusion, God, you are bringing clarity to those moments, God. We thank you for your refreshing presence, Father. And God, we stand with our brothers and sisters in Israel right now, Lord, who feel like they are in a literal hell and prison, God. God, we ask that you bring the peace, the comfort that only you can bring, God, in such a dark place, God, where the enemy really is stealing, killing, destroying, God. We pray your light shines brighter, God. We pray your presence invades those spaces, Lord. We ask that you do what only you can do in that place right now, Lord Jesus. And we know no other name but your name can do that, God, because it is a powerful, powerful name, Lord. We ask all these things in your precious name. Amen. Wow. I don't know how you can sit through Pastor Andrew's teaching today and not feel challenged in some way. You know, uh, I told him, I was like, that was an incredible message. Um, and I hope it is one that as we go through our week, the worship doesn't just stop here. It's not for Sunday morning. It's what will bring us through our whole week as you are serving in your workplaces, as you are loving your children, all of those things we do in worship to God. So uh, just be encouraged this week. Um, I'm gonna close us out now um, in this moment. If you would take your connect cards and make sure you fill those out on your way out today, um, we have our boxes at the back and at the front. Put those in. Um, it's also your place to give if you are part of Refresh. Um, one of the things TJ talked about today is such an incredible ministry that we're partnering with. We do that because we give. And you can do that in the boxes. You can do that online at refresh.church. You can text to give 84321. Um, and what an incredible opportunity we have to be a part of what God is doing, not only locally in our Treasure Valley, but literally outside of our country and around the world. It's such an awesome privilege. So um, our, our heart at Refresh is to see every person refreshed and every purpose discovered. And we try to do that every week, but I feel like on some Sundays, we just like hit the nail on the head and is there anything more refreshing than being in God's presence and worshiping? Like, today was it. So um, I'm going to pray over you guys and send you out on your way. Um, God, we just thank you for what you've been doing this whole service, God. God, I pray as, um, God, we would ask, God, how, how can I step out of my comfort zone this week? to worship, not what I'm just comfortable with, but God, what you're asking of me, God. God, I pray for each person here as they go about maybe doing what they may think is the most mundane task, God, but we do that in worship to you, Lord. I pray for safety and peace in our homes this week, in our workplaces, God, that we would be your light bearers into the world around us. We ask all these things in your name, amen. You guys are dismissed. Go have a blessed day and we look forward to seeing you next week.